what does this social dancing before performance do for the ensemble and for the spirit of your presentation? That's a beautiful question. I know for me personally, one of the things that brought me uh, to this community and even from coming from a performance arena anyway, it just gives you a chance to, to really get your energy in the space as everybody could clearly feel and to connect with each other and to get open and be as vulnerable as possible and actually see what your limitations are with relation to the floor sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> Anybody else wants to add to that? Sometimes when we do choreography, um, we can uh, accidentally do it as choreography. And having some social dancing as a warm up helps us remember how to move naturally and to cooperate with a partner naturally instead of uh, taking it for granted, taking the movement for granted. Now, all of you have your own separate journeys in dance to swing. Can we kind of go down that line? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna go the reverse so, <clears throat> When I was, uh, <laughs> sorry. I'll go first, don't worry. <laughs> When I was in high school in the late 90s, swing, there were some elements of swing uh, era style that were, that were popular and were all around me. And it seemed like an available style to me. It, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't hard to find. It was a classic style and it was affecting all the movies and songs and fashion and things that were being made. So I had a friend Tyler McConnell, you probably don't know him. And he found out where we could go learn to swing dance, the Houston Swing Dance Society, which at that time was run by Tina Morales and Carnell Pipkin mm -hmm. in Houston, who a lot of these folks know. And his parents would drive us once a week and drop us off, and we'd stay and have some swing dance classes. And at that time, swing was popular in uh, the whole country such that this was in, a, in a, a space that had some atmosphere. It wasn't a dance studio, it was a club. And you walk upstairs and it was really nice looking. So we'd stay for, have some introductory classes. And then we'd social dance, his parents would pick us up and, uh, and that's how I learned to do the Lindy Hop. My story is a little complicated. <laughs> I'll keep it as brief as possible. Um, my name is Latasha Barnes, for those who don't know me, by the way. Hello. Uh, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, a little bit far from the birthplace <laughs> of Lindy Hop, but uh, they had some swing variations and things happening in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, but my great-grandmother uh, talked about making a trek up to New York to dance with fancy dancers once. That's how she said it. But she never called it the Lindy Hop. She just said, this is how we, how mm -hmm. we dance to music. Uh, it was a very crude swing out, she told me to hold her hand and sit, sit back into it. And she said, okay, now run, jump, and squat. <laughs> and that was kind of it. To the music. <laughs> to the music, yes, in time with the music, of course. Long, long story short, I went into some other dance avenues and then wanting to understand a little bit more of where some of the shapes in those dance styles came from. I found my way back to uh, jazz, solo jazz, uh, as they like to call it, but it's really the original jazz for those who might be confused. We can have that conversation later. Let's get confused. Tell, tell them about the stuff. Tell them about the stuff. They like gossip. <laughs> you all look good at that. So I, I come from a house dance background, uh, as well as hip hop and whacking, uh, among a few other styles. And a lot of these styles, for those who do know, they are kind of an amalgam of a lot of different moves and movements that were happening in the times that they were created, much like jazz and Lindy Hop itself. So I wanted to understand this impetus, like why it was able to borrow so beautifully from everything and why it was so grounded and so rhythmic, even though it wasn't tap dance. And that led me back to, um, led me to a chance encounter with a few dancers, uh, one of whom is Bobby White, who some people may know. He teaches a lot in New York and uh, performs quite a bit. And, we started an exchange. He wanted to understand how to move a little more loose and free like we do in house. And I just wanted to understand the, the vocabulary of jazz. Mm -hmm. And that in 2012 led to me getting swung over, as we like to say in the community. 
And they kind of haven't been able to shake me since. So <laughs> I just keep coming to dances and sharing and, and, and growing and learning from so many amazing, wonderful people. And yeah. I think you're shaking us. <laughs> yeah. OK, Vida, your turn. Hi. My name is Evita, and I'm originally from Austin, Texas. And in fact, Nathan and I knew each other as kids. Um, and uh, we started Lindy Hop way back in, as he said, the late 90s. Um, and it was just a passion for me, like a fun after or outside of educational curriculum. Um, I, I actually had a lot of different styles of dance, like cheerleading, belly dancing, musical theater stuff, uh, Texas high kick line, um, ballet flocorico, if anybody knows what that is. And what happened with me is I just kind of collected a whole lot of different types of movement. I really just loved to dance. And it was my freshman year in college that I really uh, latched into swing dancing. Um, I was really moved by the partnership and the, the team effort, the play between two people. A lot of my dance training prior was very much solo, you know, individual movement. So I was just fascinated by that. And the aerials. I thought, what? How does that happen? Um, and uh, what was my passion and just kind of a thing I was doing for fun, uh, by sheer perseverance, a little bit of being at the right place at the right time and, and just volunteering, like, I'll, I'll do it, you know, that kind of thing has led into a, a full career of this being my profession. And it's, 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 it's very humbling because the more you do it and the more deeper you search, uh, the more history comes out, the more importance about the culture and its roots. Uh, as a teacher, you know, the constant struggle of how can I, how can I express this as truthfully and as well as I can and at the same time make you students feel good. Yeah. Like, you, like, you, like you're doing a good job in one hour. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a great privilege and honor to be here with all these guys. And that's how I got to swing dancing. Hi, I'm Caleb. Um, thanks. Um, uh, I, I actually just want to comment that notice, uh, for those of you who are used to hearing dancers talk about their origins, and they say, well, I started at three, and here I am at 20. Um, uh, this, this is not the story for any of us. I think probably I might, uh, Nathan might be the person who started earliest in life when he was in high school. Um, with the style. With the style. With the style. Um, I, I, was a, I was a tap dancer first, a tap dancer's tap dancer, and I moved to New York to become a tap dancer's tap dancer. Uh, and Dorrance Dance, Michelle Dorrance's tap company was forming at the time, and I just, that, that worked out really well. Uh, I was just like, yeah, cool, job. And then uh, it was a really good job. Um, and while that was happening, uh, I, was, I was still exploring so much as a dancer. I was taking ballet like four or five times a week. I was taking Horton at least three times a week. I was just going to random stuff because I was 17 and not in school. And if someone invited me to something, I said, of course. I don't have anything to do with my life. Um, and I was in Jason Samuel Smith's tap class. And there were two people who were struggling in the back, like really struggling. I felt so bad for them because they didn't, they didn't know it was an advanced class. And they were, they were not advanced. Uh, uh, but they seemed like nice people. So I decided to help them through this three-hour workshop. Uh, and those people it turned out to be uh, Thomas Blachars and Sarah Deckard, who are uh, well, re well uh, regarded uh, dancers in the, in the kind of international scene. And they said, we're, we're swing dancers. And I said, what's that? Um, and, uh, and I sort of got quickly hip to, to this, this world that lives outside of, of popular culture for the most part and lives outside of, of general um, millennial merriment. Uh, but, but you, you know what I mean, like, you don't know a lot of people, well, maybe this room knows a lot of people who swing dance, but I learned that there was this expansive world, so they introduced me to a teacher in New York named Akemi Kinakawa, um, and we started trading lessons, and I went to my first social dance, and I just, I like, passed out, I was, I, I didn't realize that 
people socialize without their phones anymore. I didn't realize that people listen to music that wasn't like, I mean, that's great. But uh, I, I just didn't realize that, I didn't, I, that is great. I, I just didn't realize that people were going to hear bands play and instead of sitting and going, mm, mm, they, were, they were dancing. Um, so there was so much that appealed to it about me, but mostly what appealed to me is that I saw the connection between tap dance and jazz dance and Lindy Hop specifically, and how those those uh, those traditions uh, are, are the Venn diagram overlaps more than it's than it's apart. And uh, and I, as a tap dancer growing up, and you know had had been tap dancing for about eight years at that point, had never really uh, recognized just how much they had in common. So um, that's that's how I started swing dancing, and then uh, yeah, was, and somehow I ended up here. This is about ten years later. So this was 2010, I discovered swing dancing. Um, I, was, I was 17, I'll let you do the math. And in the tradition of many musicians, many musicians in the Basie Band and Ellington Band danced as well as played music. Oh. How, did it, how has it affected you? Well, um, look at those socks. <laughs> those are nice socks. Oh, oh thank you. This? It's a piano. Um, <laughs> do you play jazz? Sometimes. Stop heckling. Um, I started playing, first of all, uh, I grew up in a place far, far away <laughs> that uh, has led to none uh, swing dance um, history. Um, and when I moved to New York uh, in 07, that was because I wanted to be a jazz musician. And, um, and at some point, it felt like the right thing in order to deepen my, my understanding of this music was to, uh, to feel how it is to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I started taking a dance lesson and I was very lucky to, uh, to study with amazing teachers. Two of them sit right next to me uh, with uh, Nathan and Gabby and, and Michael and Evita who had a company and uh, um, me and my wife started taking lessons just uh, for fun, um, and it was fun, <laughs> and uh, and you know, I, it felt whenever I was um, playing sessions or or talking to some of the remaining masters of this music uh, that I see as my idols, it always felt like the dance was part of their music, part of their playing, part of the way the music is is written part of every phrase that they play, you know? And, and it doesn't matter if it was the right tempo for it or if it was the right style, it just felt like the feeling was there. The dance was definitely there. I'm actually gonna uh, invite Gabby Cook uh, to come out and we're going to just share a little bit more uh, in depth about this symbiosis of, of social meets community meets stage. Gabby Cook. Thank you. Um, so, uh, when we dance, it's improvised, just, just like this fabulous dance that we watched uh, Caleb and Nathan and do, um, and, we, and we have a way of communicating that is, it's physical, it's about pressure, it's about force, it's about energy, it's about style and grace. Um, I know that there are some dancers in the room here, so I'm speaking largely to the uh, future swing dancers. Um, when I, uh, if I'm leading, let's say, um, I have to create a relationship with the floor and I have to press into the floor and let that energy sort of summon through the body, through the arm. And then what Latasha is doing here, who is just beautifully following, is she's letting that energy that I've created propagate through her frame, pool in her center and eventually become become movement of the whole body. And while we do this, there is no, we don't take it for granted <laughs> that it's gonna work. And working is a, that's a loaded term anyways. Um, we truly do work together, not, not just as lead and follow, which involves a lot of trust, uh, but we, a lot. Oh, so much trust. <laughs> uh, but it also involves our, our relationship with the music. And it involves a particular interpretation that we have sovereign to our own, to our own ear, to our own person. Well, one of the things, as Gabby was starting to allude to, 
that one of the places that we get this is because not just the classroom settings, that's the modern invention, but in the social realm, we would just go and do our best to experience the music together with each other. And through this, this buildup of vocabulary and rhythms and shapes that were exchanged, so like, yeah, we all have an understanding of certain rhythms, certain shapes, <laughs> and this is not just, you know, we go and practice the thing and continue to regurgitate it because we have never put that combination of things together before. <laughs> but because of, again, the, the trust that Gabby was noting, not just in each other, but in ourselves to hold down that rhythm, to trust our own connection to the music, to be able to be honest and authentic, as uh, Evita was saying before, to what we're experiencing in the moment, this is the basis for our connection. And then that establishes just a beautiful, beautiful thread to our connection. And we're able to use this to create a dance in the moment. And it is improvisational, but it's like we like to say, improvography, because there are some things that we know that will serve you better to stay upright. <laughs> because unless that is your intent, Nathan Bue, we, we don't endeavor always to go to the ground. <laughs> so our goal is to continue to share this music in the moment together and just keep it going. Maybe we can show you a sort of connection forward version of this. The value of improvisation in this show is not just so that we have fewer things to choreograph. Um, we, we, uh, yeah, it, it actually makes the, the process longer for us for the most part. Um, what, we're, what we're aiming for is, is a sort of presence moments, a, a true connection. Even when it is choreographed, we're trying, we're trying to dance it as though, as though it is a choice that we make in the moment. It's not a choice that we made several weeks ago in rehearsal and then we decide to do in front of people because it'll look nice. Um, so the, the value of improvisation is of course the sort of cultural heritage of, of, of the dance, of it being an improvised social dance. But it's also, uh, it's also uh, to enforce that there's, this, this is happening live in front of you. Um, and this is something that is only happening in this moment. And if you go see the show the next night, it will, it will, it will not be the same. And I think, uh, yeah, we're we're looking for things like that where you where you feel where you feel presence. I'm going to bring up this word that I'm still trying to figure out how it relates to a dance as a dancer: deconstruction. Mm -hmm. How we take tradition and take it apart and create something new, and yet we can still see the foundation from which it came. You want to speak on that? As individual artists or as an ensemble, how? Because you're deconstructing. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm looking down the line like. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, yeah, it's like, Ron, who's going to go for it? I got an idea. Uh, 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 yeah, well, um, I, I'd, I'd say um, I, a lot of people think of, of swing as, as a form of time travel. You know, you, you pretend like you're in the 30s or 40s or something like that. And I think uh, the reason the show is called Swing 2020 is because it is, it is in the presence. Um, we, are, we are doing it now. Swing dancers exist now. Real living people who were born in the 80s or 90s or 70s. And, um, and, and uh, I'm not making any. Uh, but 
uh, there's, you know, there's something to be said about why, why we are still interested in swing, why we're still interested in jazz, and why we're interested in Lindy Hop. And some of it could be the sentimentality um, that, that we feel for, for a particular period in our lives. But I wasn't alive for the period of time where we think about the swing, uh, the swing being most alive. Uh, and to me, right now is the time where swing is, is most alive. And, and we're trying to make a show that is a reflection of of, of swing, Lindy Hop, jazz music as it exists in the present day, and that has to do with uh, sort of the community and the humanity, um, and 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 the way that we are, the, the way that we treat each other in this dance, which is different than the way that that uh, that people that people dance uh, historically, and the way that people socialized historically. Um, so I think we're uh, we're trying to uh, pay pay tribute to the to the tradition as clearly as possible. By 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 making something new and moving it forward, um, uh, Latasha said this once, and I still think about it. Is it okay if I quote you? Okay. Where you said the the tradition has always been innovation. The tradition has. It's not like the 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 original Lindy Hoppers said. Uh, you know, let's make a dance that uh, our fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers did. Yeah. They they were saying let's make something new, um, and we in 2020 have gotten attached to it. But but it is it you know we are we are keeping it in the present so that it so that it feels so that it feels like something that's expressive of us. Um, did I do? Yeah, I was gonna say that's the main thing. Like the just tying together the very beautiful word that she used. <laughs> the deconstruction of the traditional, or I guess the original form of, of Lindy Hop and jazz is just for that purpose. And that's one of the beautiful things about jazz dance itself. It's, it was purposeful. Its purpose was to express that which could not be expressed through words. And for some people, what they couldn't present in their regular daily lives because some people were treated differently in those times. So by deconstructing this thing now and continually deconstructing it as we go, maybe not hyper-sterilizing it, in the deconstruction, but just opening it up so that we can make room for the way that we express ourselves today, for the ways that we think about ourselves today. That is one of the things that allows us to move this dance, which is a cultural art form, it is a folk dance, but it allows us to move it forward into the present to be reflective of the way we think and the way we express ourselves to music now. So that's, that's one of the things that's beautiful about it. There are some challenging aspects to it as well, particularly when People take things and deconstruct them without guidance <laughs> or mentorship. Then you start to get things that are not really reflective of the traditions that they come from. And so then you get things like, I'm just gonna say it, ballet companies on stage dancing to hip hop music and calling it hip hop. It's not a thing. <laughs> it's not a thing. It's influenced. It's influenced. It's but in that, it is something else and it should yes. be called something else. Yes. But with Swing 2020, it is swing. It is jazz. It is about community as these dances were started. That's how they were birthed. They were about expressing those community ideals and the way that they loved and cared for each other as seen in the way they threw each other around. <laughs> you can't do that without very, very deep trust. <laughs> you, can't, you can't let just anybody throw you around. Like, no. it's considered rude. <laughs> it is very rude. <laughs> no, not with that attitude. I think that leads us into our next moment of really kind of ex ex uh, exploring and sharing the level of trust, technical uh, uh, knowledge to live through an uh, aerial and especially doing aerials with people who aren't your regular partners. And in this company, they are kind of very good at switching up. but. They do it with a consciousness. Uh, somebody, Evita and Nathan, you gonna elaborate on that, please? Yeah, uh, I, Nathan, your shoes are good? Yeah. Um, I just wanna say personally, um, there's only really two people in the world that I let throw me, and it took a lot of training and time and really, oh, like 15 years of training with a mentor, Ryan Francois, and then um, under you know, strict supervision to be safe. And these days, in terms of my body, um, Michael Jagger is my dance partner, and not Mick Jagger, but. <laughs> uh, 
That'd be cool. <laughs> he's a great, he's a great um, dancer. Yeah, but my, Michael has been my, my, my long, long time dance partner. And then Nathan Bue, my, my long time friend and dance partner. And those are really the only two guys that I let throw me. And then only recently, I've been working with Macy, uh, and I have been throwing Macy. But as Mickey said, it's a real, it's not to be taken casually or like, let's try this, uh, which, which you, will, you will see. <laughs> as he, they do that. My aerials of, is very intimate. It's a very intimate and a loving mood. So moves that two people have to be at the same place at the same time or else. You know, if it don't work, it don't work and then somebody don't get their thing. So everybody comes together. Yeah. And that's what they're gonna show because of the level of intimacy that has developed over this past two years with this group of people. And, uh, and Mickey knows all about this. I mean, Mickey is one of the dancers who was carrying the torch and going up into the air to keep the dance alive between the time that it was innovated at the Savoy in Harlem here and, and today when we get to do it under her supervision. And uh, no yeah, absolutely. In case y'all didn't know, that's why she's here. She's here to tell us about it. And, and, and over time, as swing became flattened into a kind of a cartoon of itself, a lot of people, a lot of audiences that we encounter in large theater situations think, okay, well, swing, okay, they're gonna throw each other around and it's gonna be fun. Now, I hope we're, we're communicating the depth of emotional substance in swing and what we're presenting, but also, uh, let's talk about throw each other around. <laughs> Nathan was going to do those three rhythms and, and thank you because I really wanted to express to you guys that even though it's something we practice and like train for, I'm following him and he is still leading me and you clearly just witnessed <laughs> these rhythms. Now the next thing we're going to show is a demonstration of the, the uh, del deliberateness with which we send her up. We don't, we're not just taking our chances. So we're gonna, I'm gonna face this way because we want you to see her, her hips as, as her body goes up into the air and we'll show it going up in a column like an elevator and then the next time I'm gonna send her hips over this way. Now, you know, some, there's lots of ways uh, to, to go up into the air on her side and lots of ways to go for the trick on my side. On, on her side, you know, you can kind of have a dumpy jellyfish shape, but she actually goes for a feet out, like flying sideways shape. On my side of the partnership, you, you can throw it from your shoulder or your arm. I like to throw it from my hips, so when I was throwing her hips this way, I'm throwing it from my hips. So now we're gonna show you the, the acrobatic move itself. We call this around the back. It's got lots of different names, depends on the generation of dancer. And then the next step here is to do it, now this is a dance, it's always going to be about music, it's always going to be the dance, and the, this is just, just another step, and it's got to be a dance. Frankie, uh, Frankie Manning did refer to these as air steps, which is super cool, they're not circus tricks, they're not like, you know, the woo-woo moment that you do to like sprinkle spice, like it's just an air step, it's a step that you do musically, 
that involves the air. So I'm going to ask Eran Fink on the drum kit over there. He's going to give us two bars. He's going to hit three in the second bar. I'm going to say this for you. He understands. Like one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And that's when we're going to put Evita on the ground. Thank you, sir. And now uh, Ian Hutchinson's gonna lay down a, a bass line for some kind of a musical environment here. And uh, Iran's gonna join us again. He can see us just fine. And we're gonna do uh, the bridge of a rhythm changes. And it's gonna end with this. And this is gonna be a fully contextualized version of that step where we're doing a dance and that step comes out. And uh, that's how you do the air steps. Thank you, Ian and Ira. Nathan, since you called me out, in the mornings when I used to do, we used to do those early morning uh, shows with Norma and Frankie, Frankie would stand at the side. And if we didn't land on the beat, he had a problem. One morning, he came in and said, if y'all don't land on the beat today, we're taking it out. And it wasn't even his dance. <laughs> so before we end up, I'm going to throw another uh, deconstruction question. The role, the leading and following in the contemporary form. And it happened during the war when the men were gone, the ladies learned to lead and vice versa when the men were at. But now, it can happen anytime. And it's one thing when it, like, if you're gonna go through a, a whole dance and one person is leading and another, but now you could be in the middle of the dance and all of a sudden you're like, Switch. they ain't leading, that one's leading this one. How and why is that important in today's voicing of Lindy Hop? I, I think, you know, it's <laughs> in part, oh, I'm sorry, do you wanna say something? I have nothing to say. Part, in part, some of the answers are the same, and we just acknowledge that that is part of the culture that we belong to, and so it's just natural if we are the people deconstructing, if we are the people trying to push the dance forward, then it's going to happen that our culture will influence what happens. And, but I want to talk around that for one more sentence and a half and just say that we don't... Uh, we don't want to be doing a historical recreation, especially with regard to what we display in a concert stage now that we have this chance, because we don't want all the things about the culture of the past. We want to take Swing, which was a beautiful product that started in the past, but still is unique. And then we want to express the good parts of the culture and the changes that we're trying to make in the world today. And that's where the, uh, you know, flexibility with regard to the gender assignments comes in. We have to explore all the things that we're trying to work on socially and let that inform uh, what we're presenting so that everyone who comes to see the show can say, oh, swing. Swing is that thing? I thought swing was this like thing in the museum, but it's that thing, and, and that makes me feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And we want everyone to have that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm gonna challenge you a little bit. In the, going back to the root of tradition, you have two people maybe, yin and yang, but there's a, a two part. And, and how those two parts balance each other. And that's something, even not even dealing with the gender, mm -hmm. you know, it's that it is about a dual communication. And so I guess you're saying when you get into a concert version where you can 
say, well, we'll do one chorus with you lead, and another chorus with you lead, and then back, you know. Um, that then stretches. Yeah, I mean, we're in a time, it, it, it becomes about the gender assignments at a certain point only because we're in a time of transition. I personally lead, um, and Latasha uh, follows. Like, we do have the specialization. And as, a, as someone who carries the genre forward with as much humility as possible, <laughs> not saying I have a right to do it, but I ended up doing it, um, I actually think people should specialize. But we're in a time of transition where the only way it seems possible to allow people to come in and to choose the role they want, regardless of their gender or their personal or family culture, is to let people switch back and forth from time to time so that they don't have to feel afraid to make that first choice that, that maybe I, maybe, you know, I'm a male dancer, but. I want to follow. And that could be very scary, but if they could do both for a while, they can have a, a kind of an inroad. So that's my take on that choice. Mickey also said something super close to my heart, which is, again, this idea of intimacy and taking care of your partner and the yin and the yang to a partnership, regardless of the gender. And and, and then, of course, when Latasha and Gabby were talking about lead and follow and this passing of energy, and I think that's one of my favorite things about the dance, is the way that two human beings work together, interact, care for each other, and I think most importantly, listen to each other. Um, even though there is a leader role in the team, the leader, is paying so much attention to, you know, checking in with the balance, the weight, the rate of spin of, of their partner. And as much as the follow is, of course, listening and um, carrying forward the ideas and the momentum that the leader suggested or initiated. And, and a lot of perhaps uh, older, or more um, collapsed versions of lead and follow are just based on it's these steps. It's gonna be one of those steps and the leader chooses and you just do those steps. And, and perhaps, uh, yeah, perhaps you have to start that way as you're learning, but the art form that we are all very experienced in and the other dancers in the show that we're bringing in are just, they're, they're all masters of this. Um, we, we work on that all the time. And I think it's something that carries with us into our daily life when we deal with people on the streets. And I mean, I don't mean this to be a plug for swing dancing as a hobby, but <laughs> it teaches such incredible empathy and uh, patience and, and valuable skills that we all can benefit from. I have one last question before we uh, head out. How do your com compositions move this new modern day swing and improvisation with the dancers forward? <laughs> well, in general, I can tell you that uh, the way I look at the music that I'm trying to create is, um, you know, there's a certain style of music that I like listening to, or there's a certain uh, aesthetic. It's almost like a, uh, an accent or a dialect or a, or a style, or a palette of, of materials that a painter would, would use. And I'm trying to learn as much as I can about it, um, both from the music side and from the dance side, and then try to tell my story or tell a story that is, you know, coming from me uh, using these aesthetics, using these styles, you know, to sort of, yeah, to create something new within the, this format or this tradition, sure, yeah. Um, 
the improvisation part it's, is definitely part of it. I mean, it's obviously the, the one of the most important components of jazz music. And, uh, you know, uh, knowing these amazing uh, artists here uh, influence a lot. And we, we've been, uh, we talked about it before, but we've, uh, we've been doing uh, this jam sessions where musicians and dancers get together and improvise together and um, explore about each other's art form. Um, and uh, a lot of my wonderful, wonderful musicians uh, are really into it as well, which is cool because I thought I was the only one in the beginning. Um, and the dancers were so much into it as well, which was super exciting. And it just, uh, the fruits that came out from it is just, are just like so special and so, uh, so beautiful, you know, to see how we can improvise together and on the spot create something different, you know. And the more you know about the other side, like, you know, us, we can close our eyes and be super connected and play something that's very much together. But if I want to be inspired by whatever these artists have to say, I have to like look, <laughs> and I have to also kind of know what they're saying. Um, and uh, the more you know, and the more you can read their language, um, the more cool ideas and in inspiration you can get. Uh, and it comes into place with the music that I write for the show and in general for my big band. And you know, during the improvisation parts, when each of us takes a solo, you'll notice that a lot of us, you know, when everything goes well, we look at each other and we, we connect. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the result of it is something that is like, just, it just opens up so much more possibilities of, of beautiful things that could be created. Well, I think for this last section, we're gonna <coughs> see the values of your music as Mr. Basie always, measured a new arrangement based on how many dancers were on the floor. If the dancers weren't on the floor, the arrangement didn't stay in the book. <laughs> so I think this last part, we'll see all of these elements that we just discussed, the deconstruction, we see traditions in the Big Apple. And is there anything you wanna uh, add of before course. you get down? Yeah. Um, uh... I actually want to go back really quickly to the conversation about the roles and then uh, and sort of how it reflects our modern humanity. Um, of course, these ideas of yin and yang and these ideas of lead and follow are very, are, um, are historic. Uh, and uh, I, I guess, I, guess I, I just want to impress that just because there is a lead and there is a follow, that, that takes certain conversations off the, the, the table, meaning like I'm gonna rock step with my left foot and you're most likely gonna rock step with your right. And when I put out my hands here, you're gonna put your hands here. But uh, in the same way that saying you're, you're, you're someone's husband or you're someone's wife or you're someone's anything, that every, every partnership is different. Um, and you know, I, I, I came into swing dance and was, was told to lead because I'm a male person. Uh, and, and decided I liked following better, and thank goodness that the swing dance community uh, has, has progressed super quickly and was like, yeah, that sounds great, good for you. Um, but I, I also wanna say that every time I dance with someone, uh, the, the conversation is different, the relationship is different. I, I love dancing with Nathan because even though I'm following, I have, I have so much space to talk. I have so much agency, I can do so much. There are some leads I find on the dance floor where I'm gonna do exactly what they want me to do, and I'm gonna smile and say, wasn't that great? And, uh, and I, I don't really feel that way, but, but that has less to do, that has less to do with how capable they are. They're incredibly capable dancers, but the kind of relationship or the kind of conversation I'm interested in having with a partner dancer is one where there's a little more space for me as a, as a follow to, uh, to, to make choices. And, and it doesn't actually go against the pedagogy of the dance, it's just a different way of communicating. Um, and uh, and there, I, I think as, as we're expanding our, our sort of societal ideas of how people can partner, how people can be friends, how people can be lovers or married or co-workers or, you know, co-directors of something, I think, uh, like, like everything, um, you know, like very difficult to describe, but, but really, but really makes a lot of sense once you get into it. Um, that's, that's how I feel about the roles, uh, the, the, the terms lead and follow because it's, it, it, 
it is lead and follow, but it's also so much more uh, mess mess in the middle and it, and it makes so much sense when you're in it and trying to describe it is like trying to pick apart like the the ingredients of like a, of a batter after you've mixed them all up you know thanks Avita. Um, uh, and then uh, and then I'll wrap it up I want to thank Mickey for being a fantastic moderator and joining us today. Thank you.